Also, on behalf of the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services, the Administration on Aging, and the Indian Health Service, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Long-Term Services and Supports webinar series. These are webinars that we hold each month, and we're glad that you can join us today. My name is Sarah Peterson, and I work for Kaufman & Associates. We're helping host the webinar today. Our webinar is entitled, Enhancing the Life of the Chickasaw Elder Through Enriched Living and Supportive Programs. Before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone that today's webinar is being recorded. That means we'll have a recording available online later for people to access if they weren't able to join today. It also means that we're keeping all of the audience phone lines on mute. So as people call in, your lines are muted. Please keep them that way until the question and answer session at the end. With the webinar recording, we will be posting it online in the near future at the Long-Term Services and Support Technical Assistance Center on CMS.gov. So look for it there later. It's my pleasure to introduce our two presenters today. The first is Dr. Judy Goforth Parker. Dr. Parker is the Secretary of the Chickasaw Nation Department of Health. She has many years of experience working to increase the quality of health care for Native Americans throughout the United States. She has a Ph.D. in nursing from Texas Women's University and has completed her nurse practitioner degree at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. Dr. Parker was a professor in the Department of Nursing at East Central University in Ada for almost 25 years. During this period, she routinely took her students to Carl Albert Indian Health Facility to complete their clinical rotations. Dr. Parker served as an elected tribal legislator from 1994 to 2009 and stepped down from this role to assume the secretary's duties that she holds now. This long history of tribal service highlights Dr. Parker's close relationship with the people of the Chickasaw Nation and Native Americans as a whole. She's been an integral part of the Chickasaw Nation Department of Health for many years and was a staunch supporter of health issues within the tribal legislator. Welcome, Dr. Parker. We're also joined today by Mrs. Heather Summers. Ms. Summers is the Undersecretary of Operations for Hospital and Clinics for the Chickasaw Nation. Mrs. Summers is a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation, and she has her bachelor's degree in nursing and her master's of science in nursing administration. She began her career in 1994 as an Indian Health Service employee at the Carl Albert Indian Health Facility. In 1997, she returned home to the Chickasaw Nation as an outpatient registered nurse. Over the next 16 years, she held a variety of roles within the Chickasaw Nation Department of Health, and recently she has been appointed as the Undersecretary of Operations for Hospitals and Clinics. As the Undersecretary, Ms. Summers aims to develop strategies to drive process improvements focused on innovative care delivery and establish operational models designed to improve clinical services, outcomes, patient throughput, and patient safety. Welcome, Mrs. Summers. I'd like to now turn the webinar over to Dr. Parker. Good afternoon and good morning, depending on where you are in the listening audience. It's really great to have this opportunity to share with you. The mission of the Chickasaw Nation is to enhance the overall quality of life of the Chickasaw people. And I'm hoping that today with the information that you share with we share with you that we'll be able to really highlight that that's exactly what we do through our long term support and services. Our goals and objectives are to identify the programs available to support elder home maintenance, compare health and wellness com programs designed to promote wellness and maximize independence at home, describe transitioning elder needs and support to foster optimum independence. Because discussed opportunities to promote socialization and recognition among elders to remain active and independent. And finally, to report on the holistic nature of elder services that includes mind, body, and spirit within the Chickasaw Nation. And to give you a little bit of an idea of just where we are, we're located in southern Oklahoma. People often ask, where is Ada? And I say, well, we're about halfway between Oklahoma City and Dallas. Our uh, tribal land here 
is a part of 13 counties. We, we are in total of 11 counties and then parts of some other counties. We were moved to our, from our homelands in the 1800s and have made Oklahoma our home along with the other tribes, which are about 38 more tribes, so that we have a lot of a Native American population. And I'll turn it over to Heather now to go over the next couple of slides. Hello. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be uh, addressing the listening audience today. Um, I'd like to discuss the, uh, and identify the programs that we have available to support our elder home maintenance. Um, as we all know, our, our goals are to keep our elders in the home as long as possible, at, you know, for the life cycle. And um, in order to do that, there are a lot of modifications and supplemental programs uh, and needs that elders have in order to be able to remain in the home. Oftentimes, our elders um, have lost uh, their significant others, and so they're at home alone. And there are a lot of things that, you know, uh, elders have a difficult time performing. And so... Um, I hope to be able to present, you know, a list of uh, support programs that we feel are essential in keeping uh, the home healthy, keeping it safe, and being able to address those needs that are identified. I'd like to start with our home maintenance program, which is a program that helps with just, you know, just basic repairs, weatherization, uh, pest, septic, support. Uh, they can do small projects like installation of ramps and grab bars for safety and security to help uh, keep our elders safe in the home. Um, included in that, it, it, every November is, you know, some car maintenance. Um, part of independence, you know, for, for our elders is being able to uh, get around in, their, in the communities that they live in, and uh, uh, car maintenance is part of that uh, program. Uh, we also uh, have a supplemental lawn and wood uh, program that helps to supplement uh, lawn mowing, you know, it's a supplemental program, and so they do uh, manicure lawns. You know, have they have uh, contractors that go out and uh, will perform that task for our elders. We also, in the winter months, uh, from November to March, will supply um, uh, one rick of wood per month as needed during the winter if if that is a, an item that's necessary to support that elder in the home. Uh, additional items that we have is a chore service. Um, it's just kind of an exciting uh, program. It, it provides basic housekeeping uh, to elders that aren't able to provide these tasks for themselves. Um, it also gives eyes in the home to help identify and prevent injury to promote those healthy uh, outcomes to keep safe. You know, sometimes elders, um, they need help uh, in identifying that, you know, so, you know, Eyes in the Home by the Chore Workers really does help um, meet the needs that they have. They can sweep, mop, vacuum, they provide light dusting, just those home, home base, basic home needs that um, somebody with a mobility issue or perhaps a, a vision issue uh, may, may, may really have a difficult time completing. That can be a biweekly or monthly. It's, you know, based on the elder's need. Um, also, we have uh, home assessments, like I mentioned. We can go into the home and just kind of take a look and see what needs are there to see what can help promote that uh, elder being able to stay safely in the home. Um, many times in the summer and the winter, I think, you know, all people, uh, they can struggle with meeting the, the needs to keep your home cool or your home warm. And we have a couple of programs that are able to support the elder with, uh, you know, one-time winter or one-time in the summer to help meet the need of, of the energy demands that are placed on, on homes. And so uh, we can support them with that. We also have a couple of programs with the Handicap Accessibility Grant and Home Improvement Program that allow us to go in and do larger modifications that can't be uh, provided through the Home Maintenance Program um, if they find themselves using a walker or maybe they have to use a wheelchair in the home, uh, yet they can't get into their bathroom. We can go in and widen the doors, um, make the bathrooms more accessible, uh, add space in the kitchen to, you know, create some accessibility. Those are two programs. They're separate programs, but they can be used together um, if to enhance the ability uh, 
to provide more service to the, to our elder. Um, we also have a program that will provide storm shelters. We live in Oklahoma, and, and maybe some of you as well live in uh, regions where tornadic activity and, and severe weather is, is something that you get to experience on a yearly basis. Mm -hmm. And so we do have a program that will help put a storm shelter in for uh, our elders that have a, that own their home, and uh, which is very important uh, to our communities. Uh, we have a rental assistance program as well. We have two different ones. Uh, one that we have privately or tribally held properties that we can support citizens by allowing them to rent, you know, based on meeting criteria, um, just to support them uh, in having their own home. Uh, there's also a program that will allow them uh, rental assistance if they uh, rent from a privately owned. Uh, property owner, um, we have that available as well. So you're not held to just renting a tribally owned property. And then um, one of our, uh, the last bullet that I have, private driveway assistance, uh, many times over the course of you know, a homeowner's uh, life, the, the driveway can go into disrepair. And for our elders, that certainly does pose a risk of uh, injury especially getting to and from the front door or the side door to the, 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 the car. And so we do provide a driveway uh, repair and uh, maintenance assistance um, for our elders, elders as well. Um, and so that's, that's kind of a snapshot of our elder home maintenance uh, programs that we have available. Next, I want, I'd like to discuss and compare the health and wellness programs designed to promote wellness and maximize the independence in the home. Of course, you know, um, as the Department of Health uh, within the Chickasaw Nation, our focus is, you know, seeing patients for their acute uh, health issues and uh, getting them well as soon as we can and, and promoting and preventing disease. But there are a lot of things that I think for our um, elder population that are unique challenges for them. You know, many of them have a difficult time getting out of the home, uh, have mobility issues. Sometimes, uh, you know, it's remembering what day the appointment is. And so um, we have a, a host of programs and services that are uh, available to assist in coordinating uh, some of those projects. And one thing we do is we have several different uh, groups that actually have home visit uh, within their programs. You know, we do have medical providers that will make home visits for homebound um, elders and they you know, can take a nurse and they'll go in and do all the things that they would do in the, at the clinic, but they are willing and, and can travel to the home when the need dictates. We have an elder care specialist that also makes home visits and I'll talk more about uh, that here in a little bit, but uh, the elder care specialist is, you know, is a very important uh, connection between many departments within the Chickasaw Nation, um, as well as just being a touchstone for that 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 person. Obviously, we would coordinate home health, and we identify patients that are in need of uh, home health temporarily, or uh, someone that can be eyes in the in the home to see if there are home uh, risks that can be addressed. Um, we have an elder care case manager whose uh, responsibility is to kind of provide a touchstone as, as well between the department health and tribal uh, programs uh, and to connect them and coordinate between the two. And then, obviously, we do flu vaccines and pneumonia vaccines. We'll travel to the home and, and, and provide those immunizations because just because an elder is at home doesn't mean that other people aren't potentially bringing um, little bugs in to, to affect their health and wellness. And flu vaccination is a very important part of keeping them healthy. Um, and so as we advance to the slide number five, we want to talk a little bit about our medication assistance programs. We have a variety of those that are hosted uh, uh, in various departments within the tribe. Um, I think probably the most recent, the newest one is our Part D pilot. And um, that's a new one, and it's, it's growing and evolving. We uh, identify uh, eligible citizens that may benefit from Part D assistance if, if they have Medicare to uh, support them in uh, 
receiving meds that may not be carried through our formulary or uh, that may have a high, you know, cost. And so it supports us financially in supporting them with what their needs are. And so that's not a travel line, but it is, it's a growing pilot as we learn, we modify that uh, to provide more uh, diverse medications. We also have instituted uh, coordinators that will uh, review the medications that a patient is on, and if there are uh, medications that are outside the typical realm, they work with the drug companies to put them on patient assistance programs. Uh, we've really seen a huge yield in cost savings, not only for us, but it also allows for more people to gain access to special meds that um, I think we all struggle with, you know, providing. It's, you know, medications are one of the most expensive things in healthcare, and some of the newer medications are more effective. And, you know, being able to purchase those and provide those to a wide audience is difficult. And, and by investing in these coordinators, we've been able to, to spread that, that access a great deal. Uh, we provide over-the-counter medications uh, at our senior sites to our, our population, and then we coordinate that uh, with our pharmacists, and they provide counseling when they come to, to the clinic or the hospital, or um, they can do this over the phone as well, on those uh, over-the-counter medications and how they interact with their prescribed medication. And so we try to you know make sure that we have a good complete picture of how those medications are interacting and that somebody's looking at that and uh, making sure that we're keeping our elders safe. We also will uh, mail or deliver our medications to our elders. We collaborate with our CHRs uh, to pick up and deliver meds. We can mail order meds. Uh, we have a wide range. We, we do mail nationwide uh, medications uh, through various programs. Um, and that's, that's a, a great program. We also coordinate with our life force, which is our uh, uh, police department, our tribal police department, in taking back prescriptions. You know, one of the things that we all deal with is polypharmacy. And these uh, patients, they get one prescription and it's in the home and then they get another prescription. And, great, and a great number of times it lends to confusing uh, situations where a person may not know, do I take this one or do I not take this one? And so we can coordinate and, and take back those prescriptions in a safe manner, not not disposing of them unsafely that would, you know, potentially harm the environment or somebody else. Um, and so that's a really uh, a good program for health, keeping healthy uh, those people in the home. And then our medication assistance program is a tribally operated program that actually provides medication outside of what the hospital and clinics have on their formulary. Uh, again, they work very closely with our coordinators to sign patients up on patient assistance programs, but it's it's an expanded formulary for our health system that uh, we wouldn't have otherwise without that support. And so uh, I'll let Judy start talking at this point. And as Heather has mentioned, and you've probably heard her talk about travel programs, many of our programs are supported by travel dollars. Some of them are federal dollars, and so it depends on uh, which type of support if we can go outside of the boundaries or inside the boundaries of the Chickasaw Nation. The travel health med medical equipment programs include durable medical equipment, and as you might imagine, that would be anywhere from wheelchairs to walkers to bedside commodes, and patients might or travel citizens might access those differently. The MAPS program, Medical Assistance Program for In Boundaries, and again, that's the uh, approximately 13 counties that we have, our patients are, are able to utilize an account of up to $5,000 per year for medical expenses. I know Heather also talked about a couple of slides where we were talking about Carl Albert. Well, Carl Albert was our original facility that was built in the 80s, and we actually moved to the new hospital about five years ago, somewhere in that range. And what we try to do is be inclusive where we give as much care as we can here at the medical facility. And it is a, a, a very grand facility, but for some things that a citizen might not be able to be here, that's when they're able to use, or they might not be able to receive the care they need here. They're able to utilize that five thousand dollars, and uh, and it has to be for people who live within our boundaries. 
The um, Another thing for people that what we call the services at large would be a health spending account. And we have citizens literally in every state in the United States and even some citizens outside of the United States who would be able to participate in the services at large program. They're able to get a $200 reimbursement per month. And they actually use it for a variety of ways. I think they've become very creative in the way they use this. But once again, it's to promote wellness and maximize their independence at home to improve their health. And, and these uh, citizens, they'll, they've used it for their Medicare Part B and D premiums. They've used it for vision insurance, dental insurance, or medical insurance premiums. They, some of them on the uh, services at large have actually used it for the durable medical equipment or co-pays for doctor's visits, preventive care, prescription medicines. We let them really choose what they want to do. and we, we have a process for how we're able to to verify that they're actually using those dollars in those ways that they've said. We also have a medical alert program for services for people who are within the boundaries of the Chickasaw Nation. And this is the... Um, Initial cost is we pay for that, then monthly fees for 24-hour medical alert services for qualified Chickasaw elders. And for in our tribe, we count an elder as someone who's 60 years of age or older. And uh, that's been a, a really a popular program and is growing in popularity. And I think, again, just helps people to be able to stay at home longer. We also have the eyeglass and hearing aid programs. The eyeglasses, they're able to get one pair of eyeglasses or contacts every two years um, for a cost of up to $150. And we also provide members with assistance in purchasing glasses at our travel facility. And they're able to go online and do that, or they can come here or to some of our clinics. And uh, they have some really great choices, and it's, it's a popular program. And the hearing aid one is a, a popular program as well. It prepares or provides one pair of hearing aids every three years and uh, repairs. It does the repair cover for warranty. And the patients um, can also uh, get assistance with, like, the devices that, like, that go for your the canals or digital aids and also a replacement ear molds for behind-the-ear aids are available every six months. And so we have people drive here. If they live outside of the boundaries, we actually have a process where they could come here and establish a chart. And so it's sometimes people decide that that program would be better. And so they'll they'll do that and they're able to participate in some different programs rather than those for the services at large, which are, you know, those that are basically outside of our 13 counties, even if they are in Oklahoma. Another thing that we do, we have a transportation assistance program. This helps people keep their medical appointments, and uh, we're able to go and pick them up. If they'll just give us enough time, we'll travel to almost anywhere in Oklahoma. I know they go to Oklahoma City sometimes, but we'll travel. We'll go and we'll pick them up. We'll get them here to their appointments, and uh, then we take them home. And so that's, that works out really well because we have quite a bit of distance. Our citizens, it was one of our goals for Governor Anatoly had for us to have a person be able to get to medical care within not more than a 50-mile drive, and we've been able to achieve that. We have several clinics, and then we have the one hospital. So our, our patients either are able to go to the clinics or to come to the hospital. We also have a program that we call the Wisdom Walkers Program. And this is just a program that is designed to help keep our elders active, to keep our elders exercising. We also have another one called Moccasin Trails. And both of those kind of do the same thing. They encourage activity. We have people in actually taking Tai Chi classes. They do line dancing, chair exercises. We have water aerobics, golfing, fishing bowling. It really sounds almost like a resort type activities, but it's a lot of activities. And we just believe that activity is a part of what keeps us healthy and it keeps our citizens motivated. We, of course, have the nutritional programs, food distribution programs, our senior farmer market nutrition programs that are summer programs. And we actually provide a 
it's like a voucher that a, that a citizen is able to to take those vouchers and we'll have foods, vegetables grown and fruits grown in the local area and they're able to access and be able to spend those vouchers. We even set that up here in the summer at the hospital and citizens will come here and spend their vouchers. And what it does is it encourages that eating fruits and vegetables, which is so much a part of keeping a healthy life. In the winter months, we provide fruits and vegetables also that are a benefit that they would not maybe normally get. And it's just to encourage that that healthy lifestyle, healthy eating, which is so much a part, a part to me for diabetes prevention and then also the uh, a healthful living for those who do have diabetes. The uh, Get Fresh program is another one that provides nutrition education for our elders, which is really a good program just to teach you how to prepare foods, how to cook properly, and to get us away from some of the frying that we do and really just, you know, give us some good food options. On the next slide, I'd like to uh, talk about explaining transitioning elder needs and support to foster optimum independence. These are programs that have been going on for several years for our Chickasaw elders who uh, were trying to promote independent living. One of them is a 12 one bedroom apartments for low income in Native Americans and their spouse. This is actually a program that is set up in uh, Ardmore, Oklahoma, which is one of our southernmost clinic. And uh, the beauty of this one is that it's right there on the campus with a wellness center, a elder center, and also a clinic. And so it doesn't provide a lot of opportunities because there are not that many that, that can participate in this. But for the ones that do, I think it would probably be the ideal living situation for your retirement years. We also have assisted living that we provide up to $2,500 for citizens to live in a state licensed assisted living facility. And this is one that you could be in any state in order to qualify for this. You wouldn't just have to be within the boundaries of the Chickasaw Nation. So citizens can live in their own communities. It's been our goal to help people live at home as long as they can. And so that's a lot of our programs, but this one it is for an opportunity where someone would need to live outside of the home and live in an assisted living type facility. We've, you know, we have thought about, I know a lot of tribes have thought about the nursing homes, but nursing homes, besides, you know, being really expensive, they also just seem to, uh, to take care of the patients right in a certain area or people will have to move from home. And I think our goal has been to help people stay in their own communities, live in their own communities as long as they possibly can. Our next goal is to discuss the opportunities to promote socialization and recognition among elders to remain active and independent. And we have a lot of programs that actually address exactly that. The Veterans Program Recognition and Support is a program that we've had for our veterans and is actually growing. It was at one time, it was a lot of, um, we, we provide jackets for our elders. We honor our elders who are veterans. We honor our veterans. We provide a trip. One time a year we go to Washington, D.C. and uh, go to the, all the memorials and try to to uh, just show them how proud we are of what they have done for our country. The other thing that we're working on right now is a uh, veteran, a Chickasaw Warrior Society, and that we'll actually be building a facility here near the medical center that will be for our veterans. And I think that just highlights what we think about our veterans and how, how we honor them and appreciate their support. Our senior site nutrition centers, Again, those are federally supported programs, but the Chickasaw Nation has gone above and beyond, and we have probably more nutrition sites. So we try to make those nutrition sites very frequent within our community. We're a rural part of the state, and so we have a lot of opportunity and a lot of place for our citizens to come to those. And really, there's just a lot of socialization. My mother actually attends one of these. And she goes in for lunch, she stays and plays cards all afternoon, and she just, you know, she does the wee bowling, she does a lot of things, 
And I think it has really added to her quality of life, and she or her friends actually say that. She will be 90 on her next birthday, and I, and I really appreciate what we're able to do for our senior citizens. We also have trips that our citizens are involved with, trips in different events. And actually, to uh, qualify for these trips, the senior citizens actually do activities. We have a monthly what we call an Indian taco sale, and they will come to that, and they will help do the serving. They'll help take money. They'll help clean tables, hand out desserts, you know, various things. And those actually, while they're they're earning the some some of their, you know, some of the support to go on the trip, it really is helping them with socialization, and I think helping them feel really worthwhile as citizens. We have a community garden project. These are not as widespread as I think I'd like for them to be. We have one here and one in Ardmore, but the citizens actually be able, are able to be a part of that project. And they also are able to take home vegetables. And so that's something that, once again, we're, we're helping them stay active. We're helping them stay involved with others. And we're also helping improve their nutrition at the same time, which I think is a great a great accomplishment. Our social marketing campaign is actually a campaign on the diabetes is not our destiny. This is an intergenerational campaign which features elders engaged in healthful living ways. And it's intended to share the hope of the future that diabetes is not our future. It can be prevented throughout the lifespan, and it starts whenever you're young. And so we have... We have really an opportunity to engage not only our elders but the younger generation as well, which I know everybody is aware is very, very necessary if we're going to fight this fight and win against the uh, against this battle against diabetes. And I'll turn it over to Heather. Um, the the report on the holistic nature of elder services that includes the mind, body, and spirit within the Chickasaw Nation, I think that could in, in, embody many, many different things. Uh, but I think there's there's a great deal of um, information that the elderly specialists itself, uh, they bring to the table, and, and they are really um, engaged in the home, and not just the home, but connecting them and keeping them connected uh, with resources that they may not be uh, aware of. Um, which is where, you know, it's the holistic nature of what we do uh, from many different perspectives. The elderly specialist assesses the Native American elders' needs. They help link um, these folks with services and resources inside and outside of the Chickasaw Nation. It may not be a Chickasaw Nation program that is best suited to help with a need that's been identified. It may be a state program or it may be a program uh, that's a a faith-based organization in the community that they live in. And so these are really mavens of information that know the resources and connect them with what's the most appropriate and helpful resource to keep them at home, to support them at home, and to further the goal. <clears throat> they help complete applications for various things, housing repairs, uh, burial assistance, you know, maybe they've had a spouse that has passed on and, you know, they need support and, and guidance. Uh, they help our veterans a great deal with, you know, gaining access to their uh, benefits, um, knowing what benefits are, or even where to go. Sometimes you just, you don't even know where to go. And our elderly specialists are trained and, and uh, positioned so that they can be that connection in that time of need. Um, our CHRs, our community health representatives, are another uh, really a maven of information and a touchstone for um, our elders. They fill the gap when needed, and they're really a central figure along with the elderly specialists uh, to connect them to services that may be in a different perspective. Um, community health representatives work, you know, closely with all divisions, and um, even more so, in my opinion, because that's where I live, is, is with health. Um, and so they can be the motivator in the, in the home. They go in there on a routine basis, and, and they can see when something's happened or something's going on or somebody's blue, and they can be the inspiration uh, that day. It helps, you know, make that uh, that day not seem so blue. And so our CHRs are a great bunch of people. Uh, there are some, they, they're advocates. 
Um, they're about health promotion, disease prevention. They develop that trust and caring relationship. They'll check bottle signs. You know, I should have probably talked about this and all the health, but really to me, the CHRs are more about being holistic and about connecting them uh, with all the resources. They'll check vital signs and, and, you know, check the meds. And, you know, they may be the ones that pick the meds up and take them to the, the prescription take back uh, with our light horse. Or they may pick up the patient and transport them. We have transportation services, uh, but our CHRs can also transport. They also can deliver meds. You know, it's just whatever the need is. And, and being open and attuned to, to that uh, that patient or that elder that they're visiting with because they have strong relationships with them. And we rely heavily on the information that a CHR gathers in the home and reports to us because, you know, they know better. If there's no family in the picture, you know, the CHR, the elderly specialist, they're very, very important in the, in the lives of these uh, very special individuals. Um, the Native American Caregiver Program is, uh, uh, I think it's, you can't really talk about the elders' long-term support and services without talking about the family supports as well. You know, uh, we have great uh, extended families, but many times to keep an elder at home, it takes a great deal of sacrifice, and, I, and we all know this. And so uh, one of the things our Division on Aging really uh, has honed in on is the ability to provide um, support and services for older individual family members. Um, and they do that in five different areas. They provide information, they can provide assistance, they can provide counseling, training. Uh, maybe there's a, a, a certain issue that's happening and so they can go in, they can train them how to be more attuned or more equipped to handle specific issues. Um, they have a support group. Uh, they do provide some respite care. Um, and they have other supplemental services that they can um, provide to that family that's providing care to a, an elder that just needs more support. And sometimes they just, they need a break too. And they need to be supportive as well. And then uh, our last uh, program on this slide is a burial assistance. And while people don't think that long-term support and services would maybe not include burial assistance, for those families, it can be a huge uh, relief. It's, it's something that, you know, it places a great deal of value on the importance. You know, we've lost a very... Um, important person in the lives of these families and and we take that into that final stage of life and, and provide that support to them you know it's a it's a may not may not pay for the entire burial but it is certainly a help in that time of need and so we're, we're very proud of that program so I mean that's a very quick and very high level review of all the, you know, not not even all-encompassing of many of the services that we have to provide support uh, for our elders, uh, keeping them in the home, supporting the families in the home. And I think um, this slide, uh, talking about the mind, body, and spirit, you know, you keep the mind healthy by keeping it active and you engage it with various activities and, and programs, socialization. We keep the body healthy by health and wellness programs. Many of our divisions outside of health do this, not just health. We're not alone in this. We are one tribe, one mission, and uh, we all have a piece in that. And then we keep the spirit healthy by providing programs that develop resilience and independence. We want to keep them at home. We want to keep them. Uh, we want to support them so that they feel safe in the home. Um, and so that's our holistic nature uh, as far as what we do within our tribe to support and engage and enhance the life of that Chickasaw elder. I would be remiss, Judy and I both would be remiss, if we didn't uh, recognize some individuals that really helped us with the development and gathering of information. So real quickly, I'd like to just recognize Stacey Westbury, who is the Director of Senior Information on the Division of Aging, uh, Lita Burwell, the Executive Officer of Social Services, Division of Social Services. Carrie Law, our Executive Officer of Hospital and Clinical Excellence, Department of Health. Uh, Amy Wampler, Services at Large Case Manager, uh, Division of Tribal Health. And then Stephanie Luna, our Elder Care Case Manager with the Division of Tribal Health. Um, these individuals are key in all the services and programs that, that we talked about today. Um, one person not mentioned is Karen Cook, who is the executive officer on the Division of Aging. Um, I 
good to have her name on here, and I apologize for that. But all of these folks, uh, very key in, in the services that we provide. Chris Moschke, we want to thank you for particip participating today, for listening, and I think that uh, Kaufman Associates has set up a time for questions if anybody has questions. We would entertain those now. Yes, that's correct. This is the time for questions and answers, and there are two ways that audience members can ask questions. You can unmute your phone line by pressing star six and ask your question over the phone. And we ask that when you do that, when you're done asking your question, please remute your line by pressing star six again. The second way to ask the question is by typing it into the chat box in the lower right-hand corner. And I think we will start with a question that's come in to the chat box already. It's from Melissa Heflin from ANTHC. She asks, is it possible to get a copy of the job description for the elderly specialist? I'd be, I'd be happy to uh, connect with Stacey and see what we can do to get that to you. Yeah, you can email me and uh, I'd be happy to figure out a way to do that. Thank you. Um, a question from the MHA Nation is, will your presentation be available? Also, any tours available? I can speak to the presentation. This is something that we'll have posted shortly on the Long-Term Services and Supports Technical Assistance Center on CMS.gov. And if you look up in the right-hand corner of your screen, you can see information, including the URL, about how to get to that Long-Term Services and Supports Technical Assistance Center online. Um, any tours available? The question from MHA Nation. And the answer to that one is yes. We we do tours monthly at least. Mm -hmm. At least every month. We thought it would slow down once we moved into the new facility, and it really hasn't. So we're very happy to do tours. If you just would contact Heather, and we can help set those up. And we can coordinate. Um, because we're so large, we can coordinate with our, our Division on Aging as well and travel for tours, mm -hmm. too. Another question from the chat box is from Sherry Roebuck asking, when was the program initiated? Um, well, I'd have to know which program um, in order to really answer that question. Uh, the Division on Aging, oh my, that's been in place, you know, it's grown over time, but it's been in place for many years, many years, decades, mm -hmm. I would I would say. Um, but if you want to clarify which program, we'd be happy to answer that. Sherry, if you'd like to unmute your line by pressing star six. That would be great. I was wondering, like the at-home program that you have, um, we'd kind of like to know when those were initiated, like the case management, like case management. Um, well, the, the tribal health case manager, elder care case manager, has only been in uh, existence probably sometime about in the last seven, eight, ten years. Um, that was born out of a listening session uh, with citizens that we had about ten years ago. Um, some, of the, some of the other home programs uh, with uh, Division on Aging, uh, I, I can't really speak to the elder elderly specialist, but I can say we have had CHRs in the home for somewhere around 30 years. We've had CHRs for a long time. Okay. And does your program just seem to be flowing well? Oh, my goodness. It only grows. Grows okay. uh, every, every day. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. No, oh, thank you. There are several different questions from Oneida Elder Services and ONCOA. Uh, Judy and Heather, if you would like to look down in the right-hand corner in the chat box for your reference, I'll read out these questions, and then you can address them in whatever order you prefer. The first is, for the 2,500 assistant, assisted living assistance, is it tribal funded? Is there criteria for eligibility? Is it $2,500 per month, per year, or is it one time? 
the second question is, when do you apply for these grants related to handicap accessibility and home improvement? The third is, is the CAR program with tribal contribution or a grant? What is your elder population? And services at large, is that tribal contribution or grant funds? And um, let's see, the last question is about sharing job descriptions from the elderly specialists. I believe you have already ad addressed that. So any of the questions in the chat box from Oneida Elder Services? Um, let's see. Let's take it one at a time. I believe the 25,000 uh, assisted living is um, it's a monthly support, and um, I believe it's tribally funded. And the application process, you know, it, there's there's criteria for eligibility that's held within the Division of Aging, and, and that's uh, situational because there are a lot of factors that play into that. Um, Let's see, the uh, time to apply for grants for the handicap and the home improvement, that's as, that's when whenever it's identified as a need, um, you can apply. So, you know, the elderly specialist or the CHR or maybe it's a case manager at the hospital that's, you know, connected with that person in the home and they identify a new uh, concern that the home needs to be prepared for. Um, that's just whenever you need I believe it's you know it's not every year that you can apply, but it's when that event occurs that you need to update your home. Uh, that that's when you would apply. Um, the uh, services at large is all tribally funded. Um, and I don't know about the car. I didn't the I, I really I believe I can't really speak about the car maintenance process. I know it's part of the home maintenance program. Um, and it, yeah, they do it once a year, once a a year in, in November. Yeah. But I, I, I'm not really sure. I can find out, and I'd be happy to, to respond. Stacy's actually online. Oh, there. Stacy, Stacy uh, uh, Westbury, she's uh, connected with us, but she's in, at a distant site. And so if she will let us know, we'll be happy to share that. Um, is that was that all of the questions? Job description, and we can do that for the elderly specialist. Um, I want to let audience members know that I've added Heather Summers' email address in the box in the right, in the top right hand corner. It's Heather Summers at Chickasaw net. If you have additional questions that you'd like to contact her directly about. Um, further comments from the chat box include from Cynthia LeCount from the Administration on Aging. This was fantastic information. It's been very exciting to hear about this wonderful pro model project at Chickasaw. You're a model for many of us. Thank you. I believe our, our you know, the expansion of what services we have is directly attributable to the vision and the leadership that we have within our tribe. And, uh, you know, Governor Anatevi, um has been in his role for, oh gosh, decades. And it's just his vision um, to enhance these, the lives of the Chickasaw people. Um, so thank you. And I, uh, we can extend that, that comment to him. Do you know where I can tell you um, our population uh, is about we have 55,000 registered citizens. Um, I can't give you an, an X number on the number of elders within the citizen population. I can give you a number based on our health system uh, population, but that's all tribes, and you know that population is based off a of, uh, $60,000 number, so um, $60,000 person dollar. Thank you. Are there additional questions right now? Again, please feel free to type them in in the chat box as we've been doing. You can also unmute your line by pressing star six to ask it over the phone line. Sarah, I see one question that we missed. Um, okay. What agency do we apply with, with for the Handicap Accessibility Grant? That would be our Division of Housing. They're the ones that actually administer that process, the Handicap Accessibility Grant and the um, Home Repair Grant. Home Improvement Grant. 
does it with our Division of Housing specifically. Kim Earls asks, providers go to the home if the elder is unable to come into the clinic? They can. They have in the past. It's I, We don't have like a setup routine, but if we have a patient that we know is at home and unable to come in, we, we have some providers that can travel to the clinic. Or to the home. I mean, to the home, I mean. Thank you. We do what we can to get them out of the home to the clinic, but if it's if it's a, if truly there is a, a barrier or a health condition that prevents it, uh, we can coordinate that. We have about ten minutes left during our hour long period, and I want to give just another couple moments to see if there are any final questions today. All right, thank you everyone. Um, and special thanks to Dr. Parker and Mrs. Summers who presented today. We really appreciate the wide variety of information that you shared with us about your really comprehensive programming. If there are future questions that people have, again, there are two email addresses that are listed in the box in the top right corner. One is generally for um, LTSS information from CMS, uh, the Administration for Community Living in the Indian Health Service, the partner agencies who have worked together to put on these monthly webinars. And in addition to that, we have contact information specifically for Heather Summers who helped present today. So for further questions, please feel to contact, please, please feel free to contact either address. Also, as I mentioned at the beginning today, this webinar has been recorded and we'll be posting the recording on the Long-Term Services and Supports Technical Assistance Center, which is an online technical assistance center at cms.gov. And the URL to find that center online is also listed in the box in the right-hand corner. In closing, I would like to thank the presenters. I would like to thank the audience members who participated and asked questions to continue the discussion. Thanks so much to everyone, and we hope that you'll join us next month for another monthly webinar focusing on long-term services and supports in Indian country. This concludes today's session. Thank you very much, everyone.